Hello students, welcome to lecture 36 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's lecture will be discussing about some next generation devices based on Photonic Crystals. Here is the lecture outline, we will have discussion about you know how to develop multiplexers based on Photonic Crystals and then we will also look into uh, two interesting devices, lasers and uh, polarization splitters which are developed based on photonic crystal fibers. So, let us first take the example of photonic crystal based multiplexer. So, you need to know why this particular device is required. So, on chip ultra high density optical interconnects in photonic integrated circuits are desired to meet the increasing demand for high data transmission and those you typically see in the data center networks. Now, there are different multiplexing technology. Multiplexing actually helps you to send you now lot of data together. So, you can actually use wavelength division multiplexing where different wavelengths carry different uh, signals. Okay, You can also have mode division multiplexing where different modes are used for multiplexing. Multiplexing means you know you add up lot of information which do not interfere with each other and they can be passed or travel together and then at the receiver end you can separate out those information. You can also have polarization division multiplexing where two orthogonal polarization basically can carry your data. You can also look for different complex modulations or multiplexing schemes. right? So, these are the most popular multiplexing technologies like uh, WDM, MDM and PDM. So, they can be used to increase the data link capacity that allows uh, parallel transmission with multiple channels. Now, of all this WDM is the widely used one because in this case you can actually multiplex multiple channels using different wavelengths. However, it supports limited channels due to the available wavelength bandwidth density. So, the operational wavelength range is narrow and you have to have certain channel spacing. So, that actually limits the number of channels that you can support. Moreover, the system cost and complexity will increase with the number of channels as each channel will require different uh, individual uh, laser sources. In the recent years, the research interest in MDM has grown that is mode division multiplexing has grown since it can further enhance the capacity of the optical interconnects by allowing data transmission using modes of the same wavelength. Thus, it can reduce the system size and complexity. So, an efficient way to increase uh, bandwidth capacity will be by using hybrid WDM MDM technology. Okay? That means, you have wavelength division multiplexing combined with mode division multiplexing. Okay? So, you can say that if there are n channels for uh, WDM, you can combine that with m mode channels of MDM. So, altogether you can create m cross n number of channels for data transmission. So, this technology can increase the channel capacity of the on chip optical interconnects with an additional design degree of freedom that you have seen here without increasing the cheap area as well as the loss. Okay? So, usually whenever you make complex interconnects, the number of waveguide crossing increases and you will have more number of losses. So, here you can actually have, uh, you know, without increasing the loss and the cheap area, you can still increase the channel capacity. So, periodic structures such as sub wavelength grating and uh, photonic crystal based devices uh, have been you know catching the attention for photonic integrated circuits mainly because of their abilities to control the flow of light with little loss and also they can have compact device size. So, that is where you know photonic crystal uh, whenever you talk about uh, periodic structure a very obvious promising candidate is photonic crystals right so photonic crystals photonic crystals are more commonly used 
which can provide you in plane confinement with very minimal or you can say negligible bending loss and also they can exhibit wavelength dependence and polarization dependence properties. So, in that way you can actually use photonic crystal as a you know a very important uh, platform and then if you make silicon uh, you, you make photonic crystals on silicon platform that can be easily fabricated right using the existing CMOS uh, technologies. So, it can also provide you know lesser footprint as compared to the conventional counterparts. So, we will briefly discuss we will not go into too much of details because it may be very complicated for the newcomers to this field. So, we will briefly discuss this compact two dimensional photonic crystal based 12 channel hybrid WDM MDM device. Okay? So, it is a wavelength division multiplexing along with mode division multiplexing device on silicon on insulator platform. So, here is the source for this particular work if you are interested I have given the complete source. You can uh, go through this paper and see what kind of uh, design has been done here in more details. Okay? So, the device is supposed to create 12 channels okay, as you can see 12 hybrid channels. So, what they are doing okay, the proposed device will utilize two bidirectional micro ring resonator array. So, these are called ring resonators. Okay? So, you have two bidirectional micro ring resonators array okay? for filtering three wavelength channels and cascaded asymmetric directional coupler okay? regions for multiplexing four mode channels. So, th that is where 3 cross 4 you are getting uh, 12. Uh, hybrid channels. Okay? So, we will mainly fo focus on how these three wavelength channels are created. Okay? So, this particular designed micro ring resonator based wavelength drop filters. Okay? So, these are called drop filters because you can actually bring a stream and then one particular wavelength will get drop. Okay? So, they can work bidirectionally providing two drop ports for which two similar wavelengths can be dropped separately. Okay? So, the two bidirectional uh, MMR arrays will result in four single mode dropped waveguides. Okay? So, you can see here we have uh, numbered the ports you can start from here itself port 1, port 2 for this it is port 3, port 4 port 5, port 6 okay? and then you have port 7, port 8, port 9, port 10, port 11, port 12 and the final output is coming from port uh, 13. So, this part is giving you this one and this one in is giving you wavelength division multiplexing. This part is little bit more complicated that is giving you mode division multiplexing. So, we will mainly focus on only the first part we will see how the wavelength division multiplexing works in this case. So, this waveguides are uh, combined into a bus waveguide, uh, but different width are cascaded into you know here you can see this is the bus waveguide and uh, these are kind of you know uh, they are combined with uh, different widths of asymmetrical directional coupler okay, which are basically uh, separated by adiabatic taper regions in between. So, here you will see there is a taper region because this is narrow then this is slightly larger. So, there are tapers in between. So, this section, this section and this section have three different uh, width. So, you can name this as asymmetrical direction, directional coupler 1, ADC 1, ADC 2 and ADC 3. Okay? So, that way it is a bit complicated. So, there are a couple of interesting devices. I encourage all of you to study about directional couplers. Okay, and uh, you can also study about the adiabatic taper regions in between. Okay? So, these are the part of the mode division multiplexing system, but here we will mainly focus on this part. Right? So, the bidirectional nature of this MRR micro ring resonators, they provide a simple configuration with a compact device size. So, let us go into more details. Okay? 
So, as I mentioned this figure is basically uh, telling you about this 12 channel hybrid WDM MDM multiplexer. So, what do you have here? You have three, you have basically two of this. Okay. So, each of these are three channel MMR based WDM multiplexers. Okay. And then you have one uh, four channel ADC based uh, MDM multiplexer. Okay. These two things are combined. So, finally, you understand that this design has got 12 input ports and one output port. Okay. And both these MMRs and the ADCs, they work with TM polarization since the photonic crystal used uh, in this particular design has band gap only for TM polarization. Clear? So, first of all, you can see the basic structure. It is basically uh, shown here as well. These are uh, silicon rods on silica. Okay. And the band structure is plotted here. So, this is for the TM mode, you can see a beautiful band gap, complete band gap uh, existing. Okay. And uh, these are the important points which you have discussed in this course, gamma x m gamma. Okay. So, these are basically for the silicon rod, rod arrays in square lattice uh, with silica as lower cladding. So, here, uh, if you consider the parameters, the lattice constant A and radius R of the silicon rod arrays are considered to be 460 nanometer and 110 nanometer respectively. And the resulting band gap is found from, you know, 0.2505 A by lambda to 0.3047 A by lambda. Okay. So, this is your bandwidth. Okay. Authors have not uh, mentioned this as, uh, you know, band gap to mid gap frequency ratio, but this is how they have expressed it. Now, a single mode waveguide created by introducing a one row line defect that you can see here. Okay. And in that case, when you make this kind of a defect, okay, the band structure is plotted here and it shows TM0 mode within the band gap, which is basically supported in this single mode waveguide. Right. Now, to perform WDM operation, a micro ring resonator is basically uh, designed. So, this is a micro ring resonator. The name itself tells you it is a ring resonator. So, it is in the shape of a ring. Okay. And um, a add drop filter is basically formed. How do you form a add drop filter? You can take a micro ring resonator and place two um, single mode waveguide uh, parallelly on the two sides of the micro ring resonator which is shown here. So, here you can see A is the input port, B is the through port, C is the, uh, C is this one and D is the drop port. Okay. So, you can also see the electric field. So, this port is not basically used, it is a symmetrical device. So, sometime you can use this also as a input port and then this will become through port, this will become your drop port and this will become unused port okay like that so the mmr mrr structure mrr structure micro ring resonator is basically designed using the width of the single mode waveguide so that only tm0 mode is supported in it okay because this this waveguides are only supporting tm0 mode right so what you have done you basically um, four silicon rod scatterer having the same uh, radius as the rest are introduced in each corner of the um, MRR to suppress the counter propagating modes and that also improves the spectral selectivity with an ideal transmission efficiency. So, what are those? So, these extra rods that you see, they are basically introduced to improve the, you know, um, selectivity or you can say it to improve suppression of the counter propagating modes okay and that has actually improved the spectral selectivity okay so this fit figure shows the electric field pattern at the resonance wavelength of uh, lambda 1 so you can see it enters like this ring resonator and it drops from here okay and then here you can actually see 
the normalized transmission spectrum at output B, C and D. So, the blue one shows that this particular wavelength is basically dropped and you will see that D has got a sharp peak at this particular frequency, right. So, this is called a add drop filter, okay and the incident port is A and the exit ports are leveled as B, C, D as I have mentioned already, okay. So, you do not expect anything to come out of this one. So, there are basically very low transmission through this particular port, okay. So, what is the heart and soul of this particular uh, MRR? So, you can see that there is a 3 by 3 inner rod and uh, you have maintained the gap between the single mode waveguide and the MRR to be two rows of rod. So, that is basically the design specification. So, the resonant wavelength is found to be 1544.63 and uh, this electric field pattern and spectrum are shown here which I have already discussed. So, what you can clearly see that at lambda 1 the maximum transmission is happening through port D that is the drop port in this case. Now, if you want to see the bidirectionality feature of this particular add drop filter, you just change the input port. So, you now give input through B and then A, C and D become your output port. So, what is expected when you send the signal through here, you basically get it coupled through out through C, okay. So, you can see that the transmission at A, now the blue color line shows the transmission through A, okay, and that drops and uh, the output at C significantly picks up, okay. So, here you can see the corresponding electric field pattern, okay, uh, at lambda equals uh, 1544.63, okay. So, that is the wavelength that is being uh, dropped. So, using the same concept, you can actually make an array of this kind of bidirectional uh, split ring resonators, uh, sorry, uh, bidirectional uh, micro ring resonator based, you know, uh, air drop filters and you can connect them in series uh, like this, okay. So, here what you see, you see an array of bidirectional three MRRs which are connected in series. So, how do you make the connection in series? You basically have uh, this thing connected, okay. And uh, this is your port 1, port 2, port 3, port 4, port 5 and port 6, okay. So, these are your input ports, okay. And their output ports are basically connected, fine. So, the lambda res of the MRR basically depends on the MRR cavity parameter. So, this is the cavity parameter, okay. So, what they have done here, you can see that uh, you have R1 is the radius of the rods here R2 and here R3, right. So, that is how you can change the cavity um, resonance. So, the wavelength that resonates in this cavity will be different from this cavity and then different from this cavity. So, that is why you modified this 3. So, what you see? There is also another parameter called uh, delta R inner, okay, that tells you the difference uh, between R2 and R1, okay, that is the difference between the outer and the inner uh, rod radius. Similarly, in this case also you have R3 minus R2 like that. So, you can actually plot the dependence of the resonance wavelength on the MRR inner radius. So, these are the three different colors shown for ring resonator 1, 2 and 3 and you can see that as you can increase the radius variation, your wavelength is showing a red shift, okay. And also, uh, the channel spacing can increase, right. So, in order to achieve small channel spacing with uh, less uh, crosstalk, the authors chose uh, this particular parameter that is delta R inner to be equals 10. So, that means, you know, they have considered the inner rod radius R1 to be 110, then R2 will be another 
you will add 10 to it so 110 120 and r3 is 130 okay so that way they are able to achieve three wavelengths resonance wavelength one is 1544.63 nanometer lambda 2 is 1549.64 nanometer and uh, lambda 3 will be 1554.69 nanometer right so this way the obtained channel spacing if you see that you know between uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 the spacing is uh, almost 5 nanometer uh, lambda 2 and lambda 3 also it is almost 5 nanometer right so this is how you can actually make multiplexers based on uh, this multi ring resonators so a lot of things to be discussed in this particular uh, device but i am not going into too much of details because it is very advanced as you can see here we have just discussed this part okay and then you can actually see that this has been coming like this there are asymmetrical directional coupler there are tapers and other things that can give you this mode division multiplexing so if you are interested you can uh, read this paper in details and understand how this can be used in developing this sort of devices so as a part of this course i am just introducing how you can uh, make add drop filters based on uh, photonic crystal slabs okay and all this basic concepts which can be used for applied application the next topic would be you know, photonic crystal fiber based lasers. Okay? So, one of the fastest growing and most promising application of optical fiber is basically in high power fiber lasers. So, in the past few years, fiber lasers have evolved from you know, low power systems for very niche applications to challengers to the traditional high power industrial lasers that are used for material processing isn't it so fiber lasers are basically gaining the market share now at a very high rate or high speed you can say and they are projected to be become the industry standard within few years for marking printing cutting and welding so all kind of you know material processing tasks so their advantages are very low operating cost high beam quality and high efficiency in a maintenance free format that is very important with a very small footprint and low weight so in particular they can offer superior beam quality as compared to other laser systems for power levels in the range of kilowatts so this improves precision and processing speed for industrial material processing systems and uh, they also introduces the possibility for achieving extreme power levels okay by combining multiple lasers okay so photonic crystal fiber is perhaps the most uh, promising technology as you can see to significantly lift the current uh, power levels and this is uh, because of the increased flexibility in single mode core sizes and the increased uh, numerical aperture of pump cores in double clad fiber configurations and also the high thermal stability of low loss all glass kind of structures so a fiber laser based on rare earth doped uh, fiber can serve as a gain medium an optical pump source typically for high speed uh, sorry high power application okay in the form of multi-mode laser diodes uh, can provide the energy for the gain medium and uh, the active uh, fiber could convert the low beam quality pump light into a signal light that has got high beam quality right so as i mentioned the gain medium is rare earth doped fiber and optical source is uh, multi-mode laser diodes okay and then what do you have you can actually see that uh, the active fiber so here you have this is the uh, pump diode stack this is your uh, fiber so this is the multi-mode uh, pump cladding 
this is the signal core this is how where the confined laser light is and you can see some uh, rare earth doped fiber so these are the ether beam okay so this is the coupling uh, optics that actually focuses the light onto the core so this active fiber will be able to convert the low quality uh, pump light into signal light of high quality which we discussed and the pipe pump light is basically coupled by free space optics such as lenses and mirrors and it can be delivered to one or more multi-mode fibers that can be fused into the active fiber. So the preferred gain medium for uh, high power lasers as we mentioned is uh, ytterbium because of its very high efficiency. Okay. So here uh, we will show you the 60 micrometer core photonic crystal rod type uh, ytterbium fiber. So here is the microscope image of the extended mode area rod type uh, photonic crystal fiber okay and uh, this is the SEM image so you can see this more clearly that it is microstructured this is where the photonic crystal fiber is okay so the cladding basically so this is the core and this is the cladding it consists of triangular hole structure at uh, d by lambda lambda is basically the periodicity d is the diameter of the hole and it is chosen to be 0 0.19 okay and uh, the core is basically formed this core is formed by uh, 19 missing holes okay surrounded by you know uh, four rings of air holes okay so the core as you can understand it is microstructured as well and it comprises a balanced composition of ytterbium and fluorine doped glass to match the refractive index as close as possible to the silica index and in order to obtain uh, producible hole sizes the resulting refractive index of the doped region is kept slightly below the silica index and by precise adjustment of effective cladding and the core index to each other the numerical aperture and thus the number of uh, guided modes can be more precisely defined okay in this particular case so the mode field diameter for the fundamental mode comes out to be around 50 micrometer and that corresponds to a mode field area of around 2000 micrometer square and the figure shows the measured uh, and the calculated near field uh, intensity profile for the single mode emission of this fiber so this is the measured and this is the calculated and you can see the strongest field is at the, at the core okay so this is for this uh, ytterbium doped 60 micrometer core emission okay and uh, the round inner cladding that you see has a diameter of 175 so this is the overall cladding so this is having a diameter of 175 micrometer and the air cladding region is basically formed by silica bridges of 400 nanometer width and 10 micrometer length that leads to the numerical aperture of the inner cladding to be around 0 0.6 at 975 nanometer wavelength okay so these are specific to particular this design you can actually go into more details in this particular paper that describes everything about the laser they have designed okay so this fiber design has a pump light absorption of 30 db per meter that results uh, in a very short absorption length of 0 0.5 meter right and the fiber diameter is as large as 1.5 uh, millimeter therefore the fiber itself is sufficiently rigid okay and it has got mechanical stability so no extra coating material is needed in this case okay therefore um, propagation losses for fundamental mode can be neglected making single transmission mode guidance uh, in this extended dimension possible so to demonstrate the average power handling capacity of this fiber they build up a simple continuous wave fiber laser 
So, the fiber is basically pumped from both ends by fiber connected diode lasers which are emitting at 976 nanometer. The resonator is formed by uh, one high reflecting mirror and Fresnel reflection at the other end. So, you basically have a resonator cavity kind of thing and the rod fiber is perpendicularly polished after collapsing the air holes. Okay? And it has to be mentioned that the rod is water cooled. So, actually water cooling is not of essential need, but you know uh, the fiber design uh, because the fiber design basically could handle the thermal load on its own. Okay? But any misalignment of the cavity could lead to uh, not extracted population inversion, hence more thermal load and then consequently you know a depopulation of the lower uh, laser level and therefore reduction of uh, pump light absorption. Okay? So, why to risk all these things better you know you do the water cooling right and this avalanche effect could have essentially destroyed the uh, conversely emitting diodes as well. So, here you can see the output characteristics of the high power short wavelength fiber laser. So, this is the launched power and this is the output power okay? and at launch power of 425 uh, uh, watt you can actually see you are uh, getting around 320 watt of laser output which because the slope has got almost uh, 78 percent efficiency. Right. So, this value basically corresponds to an extracted power per unit length of something like 550 watt per meter. Okay. So, this is very high efficiency which is comparable to the most efficient yttrium doped fiber laser okay. and this is in contrast to the large core multi-mode fibers forced to operate at single mode. Oh, uh, by applying say bending losses where the efficiency penalty increases which uh, increases the core diameters. So, the last topic that we will be covering that is you know how to design polarization splitters based on photonic crystal fibers. So, polarization beam splitters as the name suggests they separate the two orthogonal polarization states of the incoming light. Here you can see the schematic doing that. Okay. So, this is a single mode fiber getting x polarization and y polarized light together and you can actually split them out or separate them out in the two uh, output fibers. Okay. So, what is um, PBS polarization beam splitter is an essential component in uh, fiber optic communication as well as in integrated optics. So, a disadvantage of conventional fiber based polarization splitter however is that a long coupler length when I say long here it is in the order of few centimeters is typically required because you know the bifringence of the conventional fiber glass is very small. So, your overall device length becomes few centimeter, but if you take you know uh, photon crystal fiber or they are also called microstructured fibers or holy fibers uh, which you have discussed earlier in this course. They have attracted a lot of attention to replace these conventional fibers because they actually provide an extra degree of freedom in manipulating the optical properties. Right. So, as I mentioned here the schematic shows the operation of a polarization beam splitter. Right. So, here is the design of the schematic cross section of the proposed polarization beam splitter in three core photon crystal fiber. Okay? The three cores are A, B and C here. Okay? You can see the design taken from this particular reference paper. You can go and read this paper in more details if you are more interested to work in this particular area. I will briefly tell you how it works. The centers of all uh, air holes are arrayed in a regular triangular lattice with a whole pitch of capital lambda 
and you can see it consists of two identical birefringent cores A and C which are basically separated by another birefringent uh, uh, core of B and that is formed by using five kinds of hair hole di diameter. So, if you look into this zoomed diagram you can see this is air hole diameter D1 then here you have D2 this is D3, D4 and D5. So, you are basically taking help of five different air hole diameters to make this birefringent uh, kind of course. Okay? So, the core A and C are formed by combination of four kind of air hole diameter. So, as you can see D1, D3, D4 and D5 are used for A and C and for B you are using another type that is D2. Okay. So, the large air holes with uh, diameter D1 are basically placed on left and right side of the course A and C. So, I am only describing with A because C is exactly the same copy of this one. However, uh, the core B is basically formed by combination of four kinds of air holes. Okay. You can see here. So, what is not appearing here is D3. So, the large air holes with diameter D2 are basically placed in the above and below the core 2. Okay? So, this way you can make it birefringent. Right? So, the operation of the splitter is uh, based on the fact that the difference in the effective refractive index of the horizontally polarized that is x polarized and the vertically polarized that is y polarized modes could be increased by using highly birefringent photonic crystal fiber structures which are basically shown here. Okay. So, the large difference uh, can be used for polarization sensitive devices that are based on the phenomena of resonant tunneling. So, in course A and C, the effective indices of X polarized modes are basically smaller than those of the Y polarized mode. And on the other hand, in the case of core B, the effective index of the X polarized mode is basically larger than the Y polarized modes. Okay? So, these are all dependent on the air hole. So, air hole, larger the air hole, you will have uh, reduced effective refractive index. Right? So, the structure of B is designed in such a way that it is X polarized mode is almost resonant with the X polarized mode of the outer cores A and C. And due to the large difference between the effective refractive indices of Y polarized mode in core B and those in cores uh, A and C, the Y polarized mode of core B will be completely non-resonant with those of the outside cores that is A and C. So, in that way what happens? The operation of this power splitter can be explained in terms of the super modes of the three core uh, directional coupler. So, if the individual isolated cores of the couplers are single moded, okay, the couple structure will now support say three modes. So, two symmetric and one anti-symmetric mode. So, you can consider an effective 1, an effective 2 and an effective 3 as the effective refractive indexes of this uh, two symmetric and one anti-symmetric mode okay, each of for each of the polarization states. Right? So, if we choose the parameters of the photonic crystal fiber to satisfy these conditions that n effective minus n effective 3, 1 minus 3 will be same as 3 minus 1. Okay? Oh, sorry, there is an error here. Okay, it should be 1 minus 2 and 2 minus 3 something. Okay. So, I will correct it uh, later on. Okay. So, final expression this one is correct. So, 2 n effective minus n effective 1 minus n effective 2 equals 0. Okay. That means, the power transfer efficiency from one outside core to another can be maximized. So, in this uh, proposed configuration, the X polarized modes between the outer cores okay, 
strongly interact with the reson through the resonant coupling while the y polarized mode interaction is very weak okay and uh, thus it is possible to choose the parameters to be like this okay here it is correctly done okay so 1 minus 3 will be equal to 3 minus 2 okay so that is for x pole and also you will make sure that this for y pole is much much smaller so if you choose the photon crystal fiber length to be l equals lambda by twice this particular difference okay n effective 1 minus n effective 3 okay in that case the x polarized mode that you launch into core a will couple to the x polarized modes in core 3 okay and on the other hand the y polarized mode that is launched into core a would uh, mainly exit from core a right and here lambda is the operating wavelength fine so the individual isolated cores of this structure support only x polarized and white polarized fundamental modes in 1550 nanometer wavelength range that we have seen and uh, as mentioned in the previous section uh, uh, that the necessary uh, condition for obtaining a high power transfer efficiency between the outer core is this equation that means 2 n effective 3 minus n effective 1 minus n effective 2 should be equal to 0 ok that means the effective refractive indices of the super modes of the coupler must be equally spaced ok so the difference between the effective index of 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 should be same so if you do that you can actually find out uh, this the figure actually shows the variation of the uh, effective indices of super modes ok so you have this for x polarization ok so it shows for the 3 core PCF so this is basically n effective 2 this is n effective 1 and this is n effective uh, this is n effective 1 this is n effective 2 this is n effective 3 and this is for those modes a and b ok so the second figure shows the value of this ok so what you want you are basically want here right so from that you can find out what is your d2 by uh, lambda so you want you have basically plotted this uh, value or this function as a function of d2 by lambda ok so this you have done for exploration state so what is important here is um, that you know uh, in this particular figure as I mentioned the effective indices of the fundamental uh, modes of the isolated cores A and uh, B are basically shown as n effective A and n effective B ok for both are shown for exploration and they are shown as the dashed curves and to obtain the effective uh, refractive index of the x polarized and y polarized super modes of the 3 core structure you have to use a full vectorial mode solver based on finite element method you can go for more details in this particular uh, journal paper and here you can see that you know this term is becoming 0 at d2 by lambda equals 0 0.747 so what it tells you that at this particular uh, point okay the effective indices of x polarized uh, super modes that is n effective 1 uh, will be equal to around 1.415 okay and uh, for n effective 3 okay it is around uh, for this point yeah it is around 1.414 okay so from that you can find out that the coupling length will be roughly along because d2 you know you can find out what is your coupling length l okay and that comes out to be 1.9 millimeter okay and for the y polarized super modes you can also do the similar kind of exercise and you will see uh, you know for the y polarized super modes of the PCF um, you can find out the differences between the effective indexes index of 
first and the third mode and then third and the second mode and they will show high polarization dependence of the couplet. So these are the design parameter. I am not going to much details of how this has been done. So just to show you that you know if you consider lambda equals uh, 2 micrometer d1 by lambda is this d2 by lambda d3 by lambda d4 and d5. So these are the parameters that tells you in terms of lambda. So once you fix the pitch you can find what are those uh, whole diameters okay and here you can see basically what I was talking about the uh, y polarized mode okay. So if you launch y polarized mode into uh, core A, it does not at all couple to core C, but then uh, for X polarized mode, it basically, you know, the power gets transferred completely into C. So here, this is basically for core A, this is for core C. So X polarized over a distance completely get transferred to C, but Y polarized remains same, okay. And um, the separation of the two polarization states is achieved over a propagation distance of 1.93 to be exact, okay. They are considering this particular point. So, we can actually show you the simulation result as well, okay. So, here is X polarized mode and Y polarized mode. So, this is A and this is C, okay, A and C, okay. So, there is something through this B, right, resonant tunneling. So, you can see that Y polarized mode okay simply gets transmitted nothing cup comes to C but X polarized mode slowly gets completely transferred to C. So that way you can basically uh, do the polarization beam splitting right. So your X polarization will now appear at uh, C but Y polarization will remain in uh, core A only okay. So that is the whole idea to tell you that you can use uh, photonic crystal fibers uh, for designing this kind of uh, polarization beam splitter or lasers and different application. So all together I hope it is understood that photonic crystals have lot of applications in designing compact low loss or even almost lossless devices which are very important for optical communication and they are going to become the backbone of the high speed optical data communication technology that is going to support the ever increasing demand of data rate in the coming days. So that completes the discussion of this particular course as well and thank you for your attention and attending this course. You have, if you have got any query regarding the lectures, you can always drop an email to me even after when the course is over. This is my email address and you mentioned about the photonic crystals. I will be there to handle and help you with your queries. Thank you. Mm -hmm.